Hello everybody. Uh, today's topic uh, are going to be confidence intervals. Um, in particular, uh, we are going to look at the definition of a confidence interval. Then we are going to see how we can calculate the confidence interval for a mean. And note that well, we will be uh, make the distinction between uh, two cases. The first case is the variance of the population is known. Note that this is a very unrealistic case, but I'm still going to use it because I can explain the basic concepts of a confidence interval. And then we are going to look at the second case, the more realistic one, where the population variance is, uh, is actually unknown and we have to estimate it. We are then going to move on to the confidence interval for a proportion. A proportion means that Suppose you want to calculate the number of people who are going to vote for the Democratic candidate. That would be a proportion. And then finally, we are going to look at sample size calculations. And we are going to look at a calculation of a sample size if the population is infinite or very large. And the calculation of the sample size if the population is, uh, is finite. For this exercise, we are going to use uh, two data files that are necessary, and you can download them on Canvas. And the first data file is called gss.csv, which contains data from the General Social Survey, and we are going to focus on the year 2018. And the second data file is called uh, meridianhills2.csv, which contains data about housing values in the uh, Meridian Hills area. Okay, so the confidence interval is basically a range of values that is based on a sample such that the population para parameter, that means either the mean or the pr proportion, is occurring within that range with a certain probability alpha. And we will see in the future that this probability alpha is usually 95%. Uh, sometimes it is 90% and sometimes it can also be 99%. But in most cases, it's 95%. We will see that the confidence interval is going to be a point estimate. Think about the point estimate as taking the average of the sample data plus a margin of error. Now, to put the confidence interval in a slightly different perspective, or explain it slightly differently, is that suppose you have a population and you take 100 different samples from that population. And then you're constructing a confidence interval as outlined in the, uh, in the future slides. And in 95% of those cases, the confidence interval will actually contain the true population mean or the true population proportion. Note that the population parameters, i.e. the mean or the uh, proportion, will never be known. Okay? We will see that the confidence interval is influenced by three factors. The sample size, which we will call n, the population standard deviation, sigma. Note that very often we have to estimate that population standard deviation by using, uh, by using s. And also the level of confidence, meaning if it's 95%, 90%, or 99%. Recall that the difference between the sigma and the standard and the estimated uh, sample variance s is that in one case we divide by n minus n, and in the case of s we are dividing by n minus one. Okay, so first look at the confidence interval for the mean. The components for any confidence interval involving the mean are two things: the sample size. So you have to know of how many observations do you actually have in your sample. And you also have to calculate the sample mean. On the previous slide, I called the sample mean a point estimate. Think about this if, you're, if you are interested in the starting salary for MPA students. You take the average of all the MPA students that have graduated from the O'Neill School, and you calculate the average. That would be a point estimate of the sample mean. Now, the components, depending on what we know about the population, uh, about the standard deviation of the population, 
actually determines of how we calculate this confidence interval. If we know what the population standard deviation is, then we take we can we take the sigma and we can also use what is called the z value for a given confidence interval. Note that the z value is based on the normal distribution. If we do not know anything about the population standard deviation, or if that population standard deviation is unknown, then we have to estimate it first based on our sample. And this is where we are going to use the um, sample standard deviation or the sample variance, which is calculated by uh, dividing by n minus one. And if the unknown, if the population standard deviation is unknown, we cannot use the normal distribution to calculate the z value for a given confidence level, but we have to calculate what is called a t value for a given confidence level. The t value is based on the student's distribution or the, the t distribution. And I will, uh, I will explain what the difference is between a normal and the t distribution soon. To calculate the confidence interval for the mean, we have to do the following. We first have to calculate the average sample. Uh, have to calculate the average of our um, of our uh, in our sample. Then we have to use the population standard deviation, which we may know, and we have to divide by the square root of n. Now let me explain what this z value means here. As you remember from the last lecture, we have what is called uh, we have the what is called the central limit theorem, which says that if you randomly sample from a population, if you're taking multiple samples, then the average of that of the sample means is go going to follow the uh, normal distribution. Okay, so if we draw a normal distribution here. So here we have our bell-shaped curve. Then we have we have the mean here, or we call this uh, mu. Then we said that the, the area, the entire area under this curve, is equal to one. Okay. Now for the uh, for the normal distribution or for the standard normal distribution. Remember that the standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay. Then what this means is if the if the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation is one, then it turns out that we can we have a value here of negative one point nine six and we have a value here of one point nine six and those two values, those two bounds, what they do is they leave 2.5% of the entire mass of the distribution to the left and they leave 2.5% of the entire mass of the distribution to the right here. Okay, So note that we now have what we have also then in the middle is we have 95%. Okay, So 95% is the rest of this entire area here. Okay. Now, note that this 95% is going to play a very important role because remember that we are going to construct confidence intervals usually based on the 95%. And you will also see that the values of negative 1. Uh, of 
and negative 1.96 are going to play a very important role in uh, constructing confidence interval intervals and then also in the future in constructing um, or in conducting uh, conducting hypothesis tests okay so in the case of the confidence interval for the mean we will see that this z value here if you want to construct a 95 percent confidence interval that this z value is going to be 1.96 okay which corresponds to the negative 1.96 and the 1.96 here. Okay, and I will explain why we have it, uh, why we are going to use a negative and positive here in a minute. Okay. Okay. So now let's do a more practical application here. So assume that you have the American Economic Association, which is the main association for uh, for economists, that they want to construct a 95% confidence interval. For the starting salaries of economics majors okay so those are uh, undergraduates and suppose that they're sampling 36 people that recently graduated and they calculate the sample mean and that sample mean is forty eight thousand five hundred dollars now assume for whatever reason that they know that the population standard deviation is three thousand five hundred dollars okay then they are taking the point estimate of the starting salary, which is the $48,500. They are adding the plus or minus 1.96. Note that this represents plus or minus 1.96 represents the 95%, the bounds to the 95% area in the middle of the, uh, of the standard normal distribution. They multiply it by the population standard deviation, 3,500. And divided by this um, the, by the square root of the sample size n. This is what you are seeing in this uh, in this um, in this equation here. So what they get is the 95% confidence interval where they say $48,500 plus or minus $1,943. Okay. So as mentioned before, the value of 1.96 leaves 2.5% in, in each tail of the standard normal distribution. And so the $1,143 represents the margin of error and the value of $583, which is simply the $3,500 divided by the square root of 36, which is six, represents the standard error. Okay, so now this is the example where we assume that the standard population standard deviation is $3,500. Now, if you think about this, this is very unrealistic because it is more likely that you would actually know something about the population mean than the population standard deviation. However, it serves as a good introductory example of how we have to think about the value of 1.96 or this Z value. Now, let's move to the much more realistic case where the standard deviation of the population is actually unknown. In that case, we actually have to estimate the standard deviation of the population by using S. Now, remember that by using S, we are actually dividing by N minus one. This matters if the sample size is small, but doesn't matter as much if the sample size is actually uh, very large. Now, the approach is very similar to the construction of the confidence interval when the uh, population standard deviation is known, that we have to divide by the, the estimate of the samples, the estimate of the uh, variance, or the standard deviation, divided by the square root of n. But now we cannot use the z value anymore, but we have to use what is called the uh, uh, t value. Now, the t value is not based on the normal distribution, but is actually based on the t distribution or the student's distribution. So, just on a side note, the term student distribution comes from the fact that the person who actually invented this distribution or who came up with the distribution was working for the uh, brewery Guinness uh, in Ireland, and the, his employer didn't allow him to uh, publish the paper under his real name, which was uh, William Gossett. 
So in order to publish the paper anyway, he actually just chose the name student to publish the paper and hence student distribution. Okay? Now, the student distribution is extremely similar to the normal distribution in the sense that the t-distribution is uh, continuous, it's symmetric, and it's also bell-shaped. And the shape of the function, or the shape of the distribution, actually depends on the, the what are called the degrees of freedom. And now let me go back to the handnote here and explain a little bit what we mean by degrees of freedom. Okay. So think about, I give you three values, say x1, x2, and x3. And I tell you that the average of this, those values is equal to 5. Okay. Now, suppose I ask you, well, what is the value of x1, x2, and x3 when the average of those three values is equal to 5? Well, I could say that x1 may be 7. I could tell you that x2 may be, I don't know, uh, 9. Now, I have picked those two values randomly. Now, knowing that the average is equal to 5, I know that the last value has to be equal to negative 1. Because if this wasn't equal to negative 1, we would not get an average of 5 based on those two previous values. So in this case, we have n or the number of observations is equal to 3. And the degrees of freedom, let's call it simply df, is actually equal to n minus 1, which is equal to 2 in this case. Okay. Think about this the following way. We have those three values, and we know what the average is, and we can pick, or we have the freedom to pick two of those values, but we do not have the freedom to pick the last of those values. Hence, the degrees of freedom is equal to 2. Okay. Now, the t-distribution depends on this value uh, that, are, that is called degrees of freedom. Okay. So it turns out, and I will do some illustrations later, soon, that for very large degrees of freedom, mathematically actually an infinite number of degrees of freedom, the t-distribution is identical to the standard normal distribution. Now, the important aspect of the t-distribution are the tails, which are weighted heavier. Now, here I have a graphical representation of how the t-distribution compares to the normal distribution. Note that you have the normal distribution is the dotted line here, and you have the degrees of freedom, in this case very high, say 30. You see that it's very close to the normal distribution. However, if the degrees of freedom are very low, say 3 or even 1, then you see that the curve is slightly flatter and you actually have more weight, um, more weight in the tails. Okay, So you have more area in the tails. For a given value, you have more area in the tails than for the normal distribution. Okay? Now, think about it the following way. Let me get back to this, uh, to this unknown population variant. If we do not know the standard deviation of the population, we have to estimate it. And think about this estimation procedure to add an additional source of error that we could make in calculating those confidence intervals. And hence, in order to correct for this area, we actually have to widen the, uh, divide and widen the area of the confidence interval to account for this area. Okay? So let me, let me, uh, De demonstrate this to you of how this actually works in um, how this actually works in uh, in practice here. Okay. Okay. So again, think about the think about the normal distribution. 
Let's make this in red. And now, so in red we have the normal distribution. And now let's take in blue, let's draw the T distribution for a small number or for a small value of the degrees of freedom. So we saw that it is slightly flatter. And it, it allocates more values, more weight to the tails. So what this means is as following. So take this value of 1.96 that we know from the standard normal distribution. And this value of 1.96 leaves 2.5% in this area for the normal distribution. Okay. Now, if you compare this to the T distribution, okay, so the, the blue line here is the T distribution, okay. so you can see now that for this exact same value of 1.96, We have additional area here. Okay. Note that the same, the same which is true in this on the on the right hand side, we also have the same being true on the left hand side. Okay. So for a given value, say if this is negative 1.96, okay, then for the normal distribution we have. 2.5% in this area here, but the T distribution for the same value actually has more, has more, um, has a higher probability or much more area in this area here. Okay. So what this means is, so what this means is the following: that if you want to construct a 95% confidence interval. And you don't know anything about the you don't know anything about the you don't know anything about the mean and you compare so you have the uh so you have the t distribution actually sorry um You have the t distribution here. So if you want to calculate a 95% confidence interval, then you cannot use the value of 1.96 because for the t distribution it would leave you more than 2.5% in this area here. But what you have to do is you actually have to move a little bit further to the to the right in this case. To get an area of 2.5 percent, 2.5 percent in here. Okay. So note that if you are moving to the right, this also gives you, in many cases, gives you a value over two. So your confidence interval is actually going to be a little bit larger than with the normal uh, than with the normal distribution. Okay. So the steps to construct actually the confidence interval for the mean if the population variance or the population standard deviation is unknown is as follows. You estimate the sample mean, which is x bar. You determine the degrees of freedom, and the degrees of freedom actually depend on the sample size, which is n minus 1, meaning if you have a sample size of uh, 36, then the degrees of freedom is actually 36 minus 1 is equal to 35. Okay, so note, if you remember from the previous slides, if your sample size gets very small, then you're having more and more area in this, you're having more and more areas in the area in the tail, and your 
confidence interval is actually expanding or this t-value that you're using to construct a confidence interval is expanding. Okay? Now based on the confidence interval that you're interested in and degrees of freedom, you have to determine the t-value. Okay? So to determine the critical value with MATLAB, you can type t-i-n-f or t-distribution inverse parentheses open 0.975 comma and then the degrees of freedom which is 35. Note that I'm using this uh, 9.75 because it leaves 97.5% uh, to the left of this value and it leaves the 2.5% that we are looking for to the, uh, to the right of this value. And then whatever value you get here for the, the t value, you can be using the x bar, which is the sample mean that you have calculated before, plus or minus, because the plus or minus is for the lower bound and for the upper bound, the value, the t value, times the standard deviation, the, sample, the estimated uh, sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So how this would look in reality? Now note that we have, again, the example about the American Economic Association who wants to construct the 95% confidence interval for starting salaries. They have the same uh, 36 uh, randomly selected graduates, and the average, again, is $48,500. But now assume that the population standard deviation is unknown. So before we said that population standard deviation is uh, 3,500. Now, let's assume that you actually estimate, based on those 36 uh, random graduates, you estimate the standard deviation to be 3,600. Okay? Note that now you have to leave the $48,500 plus or minus a T value of 2.03 times the 3,600 divided by the square root of 36. Note that this value of 2.03 leaves 2.5% in each tail of the T distribution with 35 degrees, degrees of freedom. Okay. If you want to calculate the critical value of 2.03 in MATLAB, what you have to do is you have to use the command TINF or T distribution inverse. You have to type in the probability that leaves 2.5% on one end, comma, and then you have to type in the degrees of freedom. In this case, 35. When you evaluate this, what you get is the value of 2.0301. This is where this value here comes from. Okay? And very much like before, the value of $600 Okay, is which is 3,600 divided by the square root of 36 represents the standard error, and the 1,218 dollars represents the so-called margin of error. Now let us calculate the confidence interval for the home values of the dataset Meridian Hills 2.csv. Note that I have already loaded the data in MATLAB and we have it. Uh, here as MH2. Now in the first step I am going to determine the number of observations and I'm just using uh, n obs or number of observations as the variable name and I type in size MH dot MH2 comma 1 and that will give me the dimension or the number of observations and the number of observations is 18. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to calculate the mean of the data. Let's call this mean data. Is equal to mean mh2 dot the price, the mean of the price. And here the mean is $824,000. Now, 
In order to calculate the confidence interval, what we need is the standard deviation. Okay. And note here we have to calculate the sample the sample standard deviation, which is exactly what MATLAB actually calculates. So let's call it stdef is equal to std and then mh2 dot price. And that standard deviation is now stored uh, here. Okay. Then we have to calculate the, uh, the value associated with the student distribution that leaves 2.5% on the, uh, in one tail. And let's call this uh, T alpha uh, based on the degrees of freedom. And as we have seen before, this is uh, obtained by using the command TINF by writing the percentage that you're interested in one tail. Because note that since the student distribution like the normal is uh, um, symmetric, that you can just go on one tail, comma, and then the number of observation, number of observations minus one. And here you have the value of 2.1098. Huh? Now, then if you are calculating the lower bound and the upper bound for the confidence interval, let's first do the lower bound. We type in the mean data minus the value of the associated with the t-distribution times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the op number of observations. And we get the lower bound of $564,000. To calculate the upper bound, we just replace the plus sign, add a minus sign with a plus sign. And here we get a value of $1.84 million. Now, of course, this seems very burdensome to calculate the confidence interval in that way. Now, in order to make this uh, simpler, what you can use is you can use the command t-test. Okay. Now, note that the command t-test, we are going to use this command uh, later on, very often when we talk about hypothesis testing. Okay. But for now, we are just going to use it to calculate a confidence interval. And now, what you can do is you can simply feed in the data series that you're interested in into this command t-test. Now note that what happens to Mat what happens to MATLAB or what happens in MATLAB is that if you are using a particular command, sometimes the command actually calculates a lot more output than is displayed. To access some of the output that is not displayed, you have to indicate the output that you're interested in in parentheses or in squared parentheses, okay? Now here, note that the command t-test can uh, calculate four outputs, and we will look at those outputs later on. But the output of interest in this case is the CI, or confidence interval. So when we execute this line, then we can see that we have a confidence interval and right here, which calculates the lower bound and calculates the upper bound. And note that the lower bound and the upper bound is exactly what we get from manually calculating the confidence interval. Okay, so this is much, uh, using the command t-test is much simpler and quicker. Now, calculating the confidence interval for a proportion or for a fraction is, uh, is much simpler. 
Note that for proportion we have the following. We have the estimated proportion from the data, which we call uh, p hat, and it turns out that the estimated standard deviation is p hat times 1 minus p hat, and then you take the square root of that term. So the standard error for the proportion is, let's call this uh, sigma p hat, is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by n. The good thing about the confidence interval for a proportion is that we can actually use the standard normal for the, uh, to construct the 95% or 90 or 99% confidence interval and we say that the confidence interval for the proportion is p hat or whatever the estimated uh, estimated proportion is plus or minus 1.96 times sigma uh, sigma p hat so assume now as an example assume that you're interested in the political party affiliation of voters and you're sampling a thousand people and you find that 55% of the 1,000 people you sample are uh, Republican voters. So given the equation on the previous slide, you can now calculate the sigma p hat by taking 0.55 times the 0.45 divided by 1,000 and taking the square root, and this gives you the uh, 0 0.0157. Hence, if you calculate the margin of error for this, you have 0 0.55 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.0157. Note that if you calculate this term, that this is close to 3%. So what I want you to do, the next time you actually see any political poll on, the, on TV, think about, for example, um, uh, voters that is have to decide between uh, Biden versus Sanders, or that have to think about, that have to decide between uh, between Trump and uh, some uh, some Democratic candidate. That if the sample size is a thousand people, which very often it is, then the margin of error that should be indicated on TV or in a newspaper or online should be plus or minus three percent. Okay, this is where this margin of error comes from. Note that if the sample size declines, that this term here also gets larger, and hence the margin of error increases. Okay? So I have seen that I have seen um, polls uh, online that have a very wide margin of error of close to plus or minus five percent, and then when you actually look at the sample size, you realize that the sample size is sometimes around 500, okay? So it is a very, very small sample size, and hence you also have a very large margin of error. To calculate the confidence interval for a proportion, we are going to use the data uh, GSS, and in particular, we are going to use the variable vote. And this indicates whether a person has voted during the last election with yes or no. Yes is indicated with a 1, no is indicated with a 0. Okay. So to do, uh, to do the calculations, we first determine the number of observations. And note that similar to the previous example with the Meridian Hills housing data, we are going to use the function t-test at the end, but I would like to go through the manual steps first. So determine the number of observations, you type in uh, size, GSS, comma one, and you find that there are 773 observations. Then you're going to calculate the mean of the data by using the function mean. Note that here you have to specify that you're interested in the vote and you find that 67% uh, voted during the, last, uh, during the last election. Now, we have to use the Z value, and which is the cutoff point of the normal distribution, which leaves 
2.5% in either end. And to do so, we have to use the function norm inf, normal function inverse. And we already know what the value is going to be, because that value is going to be 1.96. Okay? But here we have, uh, here we have uh, defined it. Now, to calculate the standard error, what we are going to do is we have to take the square root of the mean data times 1 minus mean data divided by the number of observations. And here the standard error is 0 0.0169. Now, to calculate the confidence interval is straightforward. So we first calculate the lower bound, and this is the mean data minus z times the standard error. So the lower bound is 0.637, and the upper bound, we simply replace the minus sign with a positive sign. And we find that the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval is 0.7033. Now again, we can actually use the uh, command t-test for this. And note that in order to find the confidence interval, we have to we have to we have to explicitly mention that we are interested in a confidence interval. So we can say t-test. GSS vote. Now note that we get the same values as before. The 6.37 and the 7.033. Okay, and so this is how you calculate the confidence interval for a proportion.